So um, I stand before you wearing the same clothes I left North Carolina in <laughs> some 26 or 7 hours ago. Um, so I'm really glad to be here. I might as well have traveled from Madagascar because it takes about 24 hours to get from North Carolina to Madagascar. So I normally don't um, give my lectures, especially something as distinguished as this and blue jeans. But um, I bought this shirt in Prague, so hopefully that you know gives us lends it an air of sophistication. <laughs> and I did take a shower before I came over, so. Uh, but in any event, I'm very very happy to be here, and thanks very much to Jack and to all of you for inviting me. Um, and I've got a, about an hour long talk, so uh, without further ado, I better get in, get on to it. Um, so as the title promises, I'm going to talk about the past, the present, and the potential future of Madagascar's biodiversity. Okay, now why Madagascar? Um, that's a question that I get asked quite a lot. Um, well, it's a fascinating place um, and it's very special. Let me count the ways. Um, it's the world's fourth largest island. Um, it has been isolated from all other land masses for at least 88 million years ago. Um, it's sort of a microcontinent, really, if you think about it, um, that's comprised of many microhabitats and microclimates. Um, I'm frequently asked by people, what's Madagascar like? And I always respond, well, which part of Madagascar are you talking about? Because it really depends on where you are. It's, it's a completely different place, uh, better, very heterogeneous, um, depending on where you are. Um, but the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning as a biologist is the fact that the, species, the levels of species endemism, that means uh, when an organism is unique to a place and found in that place and no place else on Earth, um, the levels of endemism in vertebrates, and it's true for other groups as well, plants, invertebrates, um, are extremely high, and it's over 90% in uh, vertebrate groups. Um, and for many reasons, it has been designated as one of the world's hottest biodiversity hotspots, um, starting with Myers et al. and their landmark paper published in 2000 in the journal Nature or Science, I forget which. Um, and the, way, the, the criteria that they use for defining a hotspot is as follows. It's a place where exceptional concentrations of endemic species are undergoing exceptional loss of habitat. And that perfectly describes Madagascar. Okay, and as a final point in this sort of overview of Madagascar, um, I think most of you at this point have heard of Madagascar. I've met somebody here who's been to Madagascar, um, and I've heard of others who've been to Madagascar. So there's sort of, sort of a general sense of Madagascar as being a special place right now, and you hear about it not infrequently, so, um, and especially with regard to the biota. So I think there's a general sense these days that we know a lot about Madagascar. Well, I'm here to tell you that is not true. We are learning things about Madagascar every day, discovering new species, discovering new habitats, and all manner of things. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that it's really a very difficult place to get around and get to. Um, almost as hard as getting to Salt Lake City. Um, <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm joking, of course. Um, so and, and to give you a, a, a sort of a more general overview of the sort of ecosystem biome structure of Madagascar and its sort of geographic context, um, I, this is what you know it looks like uh, as a map. Um, it's 1,600 kilometers north to south, 480 kilometers east to west, and sort of as a general description, we think of the east as being very mountainous and steep and wet. Um, so rainforest uh, characterizes the east coast, whereas the dry, um, the, the west coast is sort of sea level and very dry, uh, sort of spiny forest, hot, dry um, kind of place. So very distinct biomes, wet and dry. But, as I've said, it's really hard to, you know, be that general about Madagascar because it is so environmentally heterogeneous. It really, um, you know, again, I could give the whole hour talk on just all the different types of habitats and organisms and ecosystems that uh, survive and thrive in Madagascar. But this just gives you a sort of a pictorial view of what some of these things look like. Um, as far as... Um, the biotic fascination of the place, uh, another reason that it's so interesting is that 
those things that are there tend to be extremely diverse. Um, so, for example, almost half of the world's species of chameleons live on Madagascar, even though it's uh, an island. You know, so it's. Uh, I did a back of the envelope calculation once about Madagascar's land mass relative to the rest of the land surface area of Earth, and it's point. 0.4% of Earth's land surface mass, yet it contains something like 20% uh, of primates, for example, this one tiny speck of land on the Earth. Um, six of the world's eight species of baobab trees are found only in Madagascar, and this is a very famous um, road in the western part of Madagascar called Baobab Alley, for obvious reasons. Um, and some, you know, if you put all this together, um, my uh, friend and colleague at SUNY Stony Brook has termed it uh, a pattern of imbalance and endemism that we observe in Madagascar. And here we're talking about just the terrestrial mammals, but you know this is true also of uh, virtually any other group, plants, invertebrates, etc. Um, so what does that mean, imbalance and endemism? Well, for imbalance, it means if you just sort of do a present absent column analysis and we're just say let, let's say we're just talking about organisms that you would find in Africa which is the nearest neighbor to Madagascar and you just started checking things you know putting things in present and absent what you would find is that in the present column the only terrestrial mammals that we find in Madagascar are the primates which are the lemurs uh, the carnivorans the rodents and these animals that are specific to Madagascar called tenrecs um, and if you look in the absent column I won't go through this, but everything else, every other terrestrial mammal that we can think of is absent from Madagascar. So that's weird. Um, now, so that's the imbalance part of this uh, equation. The endemism part I've already sort of talked to you about is that there are most of the organisms that we find in Madagascar are unique to Madagascar. And certainly that's true of all the terrestrial mammals, the primates, carnivorans, rodents, and tenrecs. They are 100% uh, endemic to Madagascar and at very high taxonomic levels. So in other words, like the lemurs, which are the primates that are endemic to Madagascar, comprise a very uh, significant portion of the primate uh, family. And so it's a very high taxonomic level that is unique to Madagascar. All right, so just anybody who's just trained in the very basics of biogeography biogeography would see that kind of a pattern and like for example if you presented that to Darwin Charles Darwin um, he would say oh it must be isolated and sure enough that's the case here's Madagascar as an island and it's out in the Indian Ocean this is the east coast of, Mad of Africa which is the closest neighbor and it's separated by 400 kilometers of ocean um, so it is isolated but when we see things in in the present world, you know, right now, we don't know necessarily how long that has been the case. So yes, it's isolated now, but for how long has it been isolated? That's the first question as an evolutionary biologist that you start to ask yourself, how long has this place been uh, all by its lonesome? Well, so I'm going to show you a, a very cool animation that uh, for years of my career, I would sort of pantomime <laughs> these things. And so when I found this animation, I was very happy um, because I didn't have to perform these performance pieces anymore. Um, so what I'm going to show you here, if you'll look at the top, can everybody see that up at the top? It says 200 million years ago. Um, so that's a time ticker, and it's going to start ticking towards the present. So the, the dates are going to get younger and younger. And what we're seeing right here is the supercontinent Pangaea that existed 200 million years ago. And so what we're going to do is we're going to observe this animation as it moves forward in time. So we're going to watch the breakup of Pangaea. But before we get it going, I just want to get you oriented. Um, so all this sort of islandy uh, part land is what will become Asia. Um, this this is what's North America, here is South America, here, here is Africa, basically. Um, this is India, Antarctica, Australia, and for the next few minutes, this is your favorite place on Earth. Um, this is Madagascar, right here tucked in the middle. So don't get distracted by other places that you might be interested in. You have to, you have to promise me that. Okay, here we go. 
So we're moving towards the present, and you can see that everything is sort of shifting northward and eastward. Um, and so we're going to go along for a little ways up until about 178 million years ago or so, um, when the first thing that we'll observe right here with the green is the breakup of what comes, becomes Laurasia and these southern continents, which are Gondwana. Almost immediately after that big event, um, we see Madagascar starting to separate from Africa, and it's sliding southward along the east coast of Africa. And at about 130 million years ago, it's going to separate once and all, for all and forever, as far as we know, um, from Africa. Okay, there it goes. But also note that it is staying con connected to India. So for many millions of years, like about 40 million years, it stays connected to India, forming the subcontinent Indo-Madagascar. Um, so we're just going to keep watching everything. Here goes South America um, becoming an island, continent slipping away. And when we get up to about 88 million years ago, that's when we're going to see the, the beginning of the separation of Madagascar and India. Okay, here goes India it's separating. So um, now not much happens until about 60 million years ago when India is going to hightail it across the Indian Ocean. Um, and you'll see volcanic activity, which is this black stuff, when it passes over a hot spot. Um, and it's just going to go away. Here we go. Zoop. Isn't that cool? That is just wild. I love that. Um, and so anyway, but the point being that Madagascar just sort of sits there by itself uh, for the, this long, long time, 88 million years ago, not connected to any other landmass for this entire period of time. Um, okay, so, oh, here's India. It's now colliding with Asia, building the Himalayas and so on. And then it's not until about 3 million years ago that South America is going to connect to North America via, via the Isthmus of Panama. So it's kind of a cool thing about South America, which Jack can tell you, that it was an island continent for a very, very, very long time of Earth's history. Okay, so um, when I first got this thing and I would show it, I would give my talk, and at the end of the talk, people would raise their hands like, ah, and I'd say, great talk. And they'd say, where'd you get that animation? Um, so I now head them off. So Chris Scotese, it's called the Paleo Map Project. If you're interested, just Google the Paleo Map Project, and you'll find his website. There's all kinds of cool stuff there. Okay, so the questions that I and my lab group um, uh, have been asking through the past 20 years or so um, that, that sort of focus a lot of our research, sort of the deep uh, historical biogeography bio parts of it anyway, are how many times, when, and by what mechanisms did terrestrial mammals, now broadly writ more into vertebrates, uh, colonize Madagascar? So we're asking how, when, and by what mechanisms did things get from where they were to Madagascar, or were they already there? Um, so anybody, again, with common sense who wants to know the answer to those kinds of questions, the first thing they're going to say is, well, look in the fossil record. And you can find the oldest lemur fossil, the oldest tenrec fossil, etc. And then at least you've got a minimum age for how long these things have been in Madagascar, right? Um, and the period of time that we're most interested in in mammalian or placental mammal history is sort of past the Cretaceous boundary up through the present. Well, this is what the fossil record looks like for that period of time in Madagascar, the terrestrial fossil record, that is. There's a really good marine fossil record, but that doesn't do us much good. Um, and then, you know, so that's the answer, no fossils, uh, sorry. And then people ask me, well, why aren't there any fossils? And I used to ask that question a lot myself. And it's just a, a matter of geological accident, really, that I'm alive at the wrong time in Earth's history to see the fossil record for the terrestrial, you know, for the for the Cenozoic in Madagascar, for the terrestrial fossil record, because all of the good exposures, which are all concentrated on the west coast, like, again, I told you there's rainforest in the east coast, right? That's not a good place to look for fossils. Rainforest is the worst place you look for fossils. But uh, the dry west, there's some very good exposures. But the most recent exposure is the late Cretaceous, or, to put it in context, sort of the end of the age of dinosaurs. So there just isn't, there aren't the exposures. And believe me, people have looked, and they've looked really carefully and very hard to find uh, terrestrial um, fossils uh, for the appropriate period. And they're just not there yet. In another 100 million years or so, we might have better luck. Okay, so that's sort of the background on uh, the planetary 
Earth's history as it relates to Madagascar. Now let's move to the present and talk about some of the pressures that uh, Madagascar is facing. Um, it is notoriously um, the victim of slash and burn agriculture. And for many, many years, up until just a couple of years ago, I, when I would give a talk, I would always talk about this as like an insidious process, very damaging, but really hard to uh, combat in the sense that there weren't any bad guys. You know, it's just people trying to feed their families and, you know, ignorance and poverty and so on. Well, that's changed uh, dramatically. Um, oh, uh, just to give you a little, some statistics on humans. Humans didn't arrive in Madagascar until about 2,000 years ago. The current population is about 16 million. Actually, it's getting closer to 18 million now. Growth rate about 3.1% per year. Per capita annual income is about $250. So very, very poor, poor place. And again, subsistence needs rice, pasture, fuel. But recently, mining operations are, are swinging into full gear, and that is uh, taking a, a very heavy toll on the forests and the lemurs' habitats. Um, and even worse, in many ways, is the current political turmoil. This is a uh, statement released by the U.S. Department of State last March, March 13th. Madagascar's political crisis has entered a dangerous phase. While the new Malagasy government is otherwise preoccupied and some park rangers have left their posts, armed groups are cutting down valuable rosewood trees. These activities are threatening animals such as the silky shifaka, which is one of the world's, uh, one of the 25 most endangered primates in the world. So um, the political crisis is having severe impacts on conservation activities in Madagascar, and had the deforestation has just ramped up in a very uh, alarming way. Okay, so that's what's going on in Madagascar right now, pretty grim. But let's go back to the biota and, and look at some nice pictures. So again, I've told you that there are carnivorans in Madagascar that are native to Madagascar and unique to Madagascar. They're sort of mongoose-looking things, civet-looking things, and this crazy-looking animal called a fusa, which I tell people it looks like a bear and a cat and a dog kind of smooshed together. Um, and these are fascinating animals, but I don't don't have much time to talk about them. There are rodents that are native to Madagascar. And there's, we can see some really interesting cases of convergent evolution. Here's this thing, hypogeomes, um, which is converging on bunny rabbits with big ears and sort of saltatory feet. And it's, you know, about this tall standing. Here's this uh, arboreal sort of mousy looking thing. Here, here's everything, you know, looks for all the world like a little field mouse. And here's something that looks for all the world like a vole. But these are not related to voles. They're, you know, these are, this is convergent evolution. And then the tin racks that I've told you about, these are Afrotherians. And um, so we have one that's convergent on a hedgehog. Now, this animal is more closely related to an elephant than it is to a hedgehog, um, believe it or not. So this is convergent evolution gone wild. Uh, here's a little, you know, sort of a shrew-looking thing. And then here's this aquatic beast. And this is one that a friend of mine said looks just like James Brown. Um, so... <laughs> And we've got convergent evolution on James Brown. Um, but these animals are only found in Madagascar. And then, of course, there are the lemurs, um, which are my passion. Um, so just to show you some of the lemurs, and almost all of these photographs were taken at the Duke Lemur Center, where I'm the director. Um, this is a, and, and taken by our fabulous registrar, David Herring. He's uh, our photographer, our local photographer, too. So this is a shifaka. This is in the group, that the big acrobatic leaping groups. Um, the injury, for, <laughs> who has the call that I played at the table tonight. If you all heard some really bizarre sound going on at dinner, that's what it was, the call of the injury. Um, this is a fat-tailed dwarf lemur. It is the world's only hibernating primate. Um, stores fat in its tail for part of the year and then flat-out hibernates for half of the year. Um, this is a mouse lemur closely related to the dwarf lemur. It's the world's uh, smallest living primate. This is a great big massive adult male, you know, obviously a terror. Um, we have uh, diurnal gregarious lemurs, like the ring-tailed lemurs here. We have nocturnal lemurs. Um, <laughs> this was taken in Madagascar. Um, 
And we have some lemurs that are cuter than a bug's ear. Um, this is a hapolemur grizzius baby or a bamboo lemur. And then we have some that you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley. Um, this is a, an eye eye, which deserves its own lecture. It's a fascinating creature. They have this long tapping finger, and they do an echolocation behavior to find their food with this tapping finger and big ears and rodent-like incisors, and there's amazing creatures. And we have 23 of them at the lemur center if you ever want to see one. And what um, a lot of people fail to recognize is that there was a, a, a lot of big-bodied primates that lived in Madagascar up until very recently and all began to go extinct about 2,000 years ago, which, not coincidentally, um, it's about the time that humans arrived. So we have all of these guys. All right, now it's class time. <laughs> um, I'm just going to take a second because from here on out, I'm going to be skimming across the surface of a lot of different work, lots of data, lots of analyses, and I'm just going to be giving you the punch lines from all these different lines of uh, investigation. But in almost every case, the sort of underlying uh, analysis and data that we use are something called phylogenies. And uh, so that you don't just, or aren't just like completely lost for the rest of the talk, I want to tell you what a, a phylogeny is. Uh, basically, a phylogeny is a sort of a map of ancestor descendant relationships among organisms and here the organisms are a b c d and e um, so just to get you oriented um, so the terminal node would be say a species of interest we'll call it e uh, down at the bottom of this figure we have the root of the tree or the ancestral node and what that's saying is a b c a, B, C, D, and E share this common ancestor back at this root node. Um, then we could have internal nodes. This one says D and E shared a common ancestor that none of the rest of them shared, right? A, B, C, A, B, and C did not share this common ancestor with D and E. Um, then we have branches in between these nodes, and we use these also. The length of these branches can be very informative. And also, here's another internal node uh, showing that A, B, C, A, and B, and C shared a common ancestor, not with shared with any of these others. And when you see something like this, we say that A, B, and C form a clade. So when I talk about a clade, this is what I'm talking about: a monophyletic group where all the members of that group shared a common ancestor, not shared with any of the other organisms in the analysis. Okay, so that was phylogeny 101. Um, now on to the lemur. So to, to really get a grasp on any of the questions that we wanted to ask, we had to have a really sound phylogeny for the lemurs. So recently we, did, we put together what we call a phylogenomics toolkit where we uh, um, designed a bunch of new primers and we really sort of mined the whole genome for data. And it's a huge data set. I won't go into the details. Um, and we published that just recently. We got our phylogeny. And it was great because uh, using all of these data, we found um, that virtually all the nodes have very strong statistical support. But the bottom line, which supports work that I had been doing for a long time, but with small data sets, and now it's just like kabam with the big hammer, lemurs form a clade, which is the bottom line. OK, what does that say about lemurs? It means they have a single origin in Madagascar. OK. That means they arrived in Madagascar once and only once and have radiated from that common ancestor in Madagascar. Now the question is when and how did that common ancestor get to Madagascar? Um, and also to just digress for a little bit, so I started doing this work back in the 90s, um, and it sort of started a, a bit of a cottage industry where people started looking at other organisms, vertebrates particularly, in Madagascar asking these same kinds of questions. And over and over and over and over again, you get the same result of a single origin for the group. Uh, the chameleons have a, tell a very different story, but I won't go into that, but there's a very cool um, uh, you know, sort of backstory to that. Okay, so the question that we want to ask is, did lemurs and all these other critters get there by vicariance, which would mean that they were already on Madagascar when it started to split from all these other land masses? That's vicariant biogeography. They're already there, and they just sort of take a ride um, as Madagascar moves away from other land masses. Or did they disperse there from somewhere else? Um, so if they're vicariant, uh, they would be called paleoendemics, and if they're disperse, they would call it, be called neo-endemics, okay? 
Um, so what does this mean for Madagascar? If clades are very old, so older than 88 million years ago, which is the time we know was the last time that Madagascar was connected with any other part of the planet, right, with India, then they probably result from vicariants, i.e., they were already on Madagascar when it separated from other land masses. If they are younger, then they must have dispersed from elsewhere, right? I mean, that's the only other explanation, really, although I'll talk about one sort of hedgy one. Um, and if they did disperse from elsewhere, they would have had to cross a large marine barrier to get there. Um, that's just the way it is. Okay, so how do we begin to answer these questions? You know, how do we get at, you know, was it vicariance or was it dispersal? Well, we have to estimate the age of these different groups, right? Well, we know that the fossil record isn't going to allow us to do that. So um, I've sort of made my living, really, on using something called um, molecular phylogenetic dating. Um, and I'll just go through this very quickly. Uh, so if we have an area one and an area two, we have organisms distributed across these two areas. We have a phylogeny for these organisms. Um, we can look at the shape of the tree, and we see that the, here's this group here in area two. It's sister group, so the group that's most closely related is in area one, and the sister group to that whole clade is also in area one. So we infer then that this ancestral node originated in area one. That just, you'll have to take my word for it um, at this point. So then we infer that there was colonization from area one to area two. So let's just say, uh, just wild, you know, um, random example, we'll call Area 1 Africa and Area 2 Madagascar. So we're saying that, you know, we can see that lorises and monkeys are in, air, in Africa and lemurs are in, in Madagascar. We infer that there was a colonization from Africa to Madagascar. We want to know when that happened. Um, so we, if we put an age on this node and an age on that node, then we constrain the time during which this could have happened, right? Does that make sense, everybody? All right. So stem node and crown node, and we use the shape of the tree and the ages of the nodes to use these, make these estimations. So I'm, I'm going to stop there because beyond that it gets pretty arcane. Um, so these are the kinds of methods that I have used um, to determine some of these questions. Okay, um, so here's a, an example of one of these efforts. Um, this is a paper, this is a mouse lemur, uh, with a cherry blossom, so we know it's not in Madagascar, it's at the lemur center. Um, so this is uh, a paper we published in Systematic Biology, which is actually a pretty prestigious journal and, you know, pretty serious. Um, and the name of the, the paper was Comparison of Likelihood and Bayesian Methods for Estimating Divergence Times Using Multiple Gene Loci and Calibration Points with Application to Irradiation of Cute-Looking Mouse Lemur Species. <laughs> And I wrote this paper with my uh, brilliant colleague, Zihang Yang, who's uh, Chinese and uh, just a brilliant guy. And it's his fault that that title is the way it is. We sort of emailed back and forth about it. And so we decided, oh, what the heck, we'll submit it and um, see if we can get away with it. And that we had three reviews that came back as well as a letter from the associate editor. And the only hint that there was a problem with the, with the title was one of the reviewers said, I think the title's a little long. Um, <laughs> so we just ignored it and went ahead. Um, so, but what was the paper about? It was actually about weighty matters. Uh, we were interested in estimating the age of the, the mouse lemur radiation. Um, and so we looked at it in context with other, uh, strep, what are called strepsirine primates, so other lemurs, and then their close relatives, the bush babies and lorises, the monkeys and apes and humans, and then all kinds of other mammals. Um, what did we find? We found out that the ancestral mouse lemur seems to have been around perhaps as old as 10 million years ago. For context, that was about the same time that humans and gorillas split. Um, and in a minute, I'm going to show you what mouse, how different mouse lemurs are from one another. Let me tell you, not very different at all. So we can say that rates of morphological evolution have really been different um, in mouse lemurs and uh, apes, humans and gorillas. Um, and we also found, and this was an estimated age for the split between the bush babies and the slow lorises of 40 million years ago. At the time we published this, that was twice as old as any fossil 
for either one of these lineages in the whole world. And so Zihang is a, a statistical geneticist theorist and doesn't know anything about uh, the organism. So I, and I didn't tell him because I didn't want to worry him <laughs> that we were getting ready to say something completely outrageous. Um, but, and so, you know, but we, so we plowed ahead. Um, I've already told you all this stuff. Mouse lemur is surprisingly old. Lorises and Galagos twice as old as expected. Um, and again, I had not told Zihang just how alarming this might be to anthropologists. Well, about, as our paper was actually in the press, so we had the page proofs and everything, um, this paper was published in Nature, Fossil Evidence for an Ancient Divergence of Lorises and Galagos. And this paper, uh, for the first time, or, uh, published on the oldest tooth comb primates ever found. And um, just to digress for just a second, lorises, bush babies, and lemurs all share a, a very unique uh, characteristic, very distinctive, where their lower teeth are compressed and elongated into a comb, and they use this for grooming. And you can actually, under scanning electron microscopes, see the striations where the hairs pass over the teeth. And they did that with these fossils and saw that you know, the little striations of the hair. So 40, oh, I'm giving myself away. Um, so a long time ago, um, these guys were already using these, uh, these teeth to, um, to groom with. And the fossils were a, a very basal bush baby and a very basal slow loris. So it, these fossils are right just about at the split of the galagos and the lorises. So what was the age of that split based on the fossil record? 40 million years ago. So it was very exciting and satisfactory. And then I told Zihang, <laughs> hey, guess what? We were right. Um, that, you know, there was this great congruence between our esti estimate, you know, which is, boy, talk about assumptions being made in these analyses and uh, the fossil record support. So anyway, we felt really good about our dates at that point. And so what did we find? Um, so we estimated that the ancestral lemur uh, probably was in Madagascar um, at at the, old, at the most recent, um, 62 million years ago, what did the world look like 62 million years ago? Well, as you've seen, um, India had already separated from Madagascar and was well on its way to colliding with Asia, so Madagascar is sitting out there um, all by its lonesome. Now, there's something also very interesting about that 62 million year ago age. It is very close to the time uh, where there was a massively important geological uh, event on, in Earth's history. It's called the Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary. Um, at almost precisely 65 million years ago, an asteroid that was nearly 10 kilometers wide slammed into what is now Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. And we can see the crater, you know, there's the evidence is overwhelming that this event occurred. Now, the consequences of this event are debatable. Um, and, you know, as school children, we learn, you know, this is what wiped out the dinosaurs and the mammals, came, you know, triumphed and so on. But one thing everybody agrees upon is that all hell breaks loose um, after this uh, asteroid slams into the planet. <clears throat> now, one of the more sort of doomsday scenarios has it that as the asteroid hit the Earth, um, it, you know, it hits at such velocity and it's such a big thing that it creates these superheated particles that, you know, blast up into the atmosphere, creating these um, wildfires that are up, you know, in the air. And because of the rotation of the Earth, these, these wildfires would have spread very rapidly um, to the different hemispheres and sort of swept over the globe. Um, and if this is true, Madagascar would have been right in its path. Um, and this is just sort of completing the scenario out to 17 hours after the impact. Um, so potentially, what I take from this is that if this uh, scenario is correct, Madagascar might have had its slate wiped clean um, in many ways, biotically, um, at the KT boundary. So if lemurs arrived in Madagascar at around you know, 62 million years ago, they could well have been the first placental mammals to make it to Madagascar. So they would have arrived in Madagascar, there would have been no predators, and there would have been uh, no, at least no mammalian competitors. Uh, so it would have been quite the brave new world for lemurs when they got there. But I still wonder, how the heck did they get there in the first place? Uh, one hypothesis that was published back in 1997 has it that there was an island chain that existed uh, from 45 to 26 million years ago and that, you know, 
organisms could have basically just walked from Africa over to Madagascar. Um, so what we did was we wanted to compare the age estimates for the carnivorans and the lemurs, and the idea would be that if this land bridge did actually exist, and it explains the dispersal of organisms from Africa to Madagascar, that their age estimates would have fallen into that window, right, that time window when the land bridge would have existed, and it should be true of all the mammals. Um, so we looked at, so we did in a single uh, combined, so here's this big phylogeny, and here's the node that's the ancestral lemur node, and here's the node that's the ancestral uh, carnivoran node. And if we use uh, the phylogeny as a, t as a uh, proxy for time, we can see that the lemurs appear to be much older than the carnivorans, and the um, more sophisticated analyses bear that out. But also we would say, well, this is not a single event. And if we map it out relative to this land bridge, here's this time window when the land bridge would have been there. All of the ages that we estimated for the carnivorans are much younger than the land bridge and the lemurs much older. So it seems that the land bridge doesn't explain either the carnivorans or the lemurs. So and there's the KT boundary. Um, so there's a paper that's just been published in Nature recently um, by Ali and Huber, and they actually took a look at this, and they showed also using geological um, data that although there, you know, this it's called the Davy Ridge, where there are a lot of sort of high mountain peaks uh, under the ocean, that you know, there might have been parts of the ridge that maybe, so this blue is the water, that might have peaked their little heads up over the water possibly, but they're showing the lowest sea level and the highest peaks of the, of the Davy Ridge, and they're saying, you know, the geological data does not bear out this hypothesis of the land bridge either. So, yeah. um, okay, that's the, the, the lowest watermark, high watermark, and here are the highest peaks. You can see that. They don't poke above. Okay, so let's get back to vicariance and dispersal. So paleoendemics, they would be old. Neoendemics, they would be young. Um, this is analysis done by Bryce Noonan and Paul Chippendale, published in the American Naturalist in 2006, where they looked at some age estimates for a bunch of birds and mammals and some herps. I won't talk about the herps. Um, but all the birds and mammals are quite young and younger than the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Um, also, in an analysis that I did with a graduate student in my lab, Mike Nowak, we looked at the relationship of all the organisms in Madagascar and who are their closest relatives. So who are the sister groups of these different Malagasy clades? And Africa represents blue. So we've got plants, vertebrates, and invertebrates. And you can see that you know, the preponderance of closest relatives are African. So preponderance of sister groups are found in Africa, blue. So we come up with this as our <laughs> best um, estimate of how lemurs and other organisms got to Madagascar. They rafted um, across the, the Mozambique Channel to get from Africa to Madagascar. But that's been, um, there are a lot of doubters um, to this hypothesis. <laughs> Certainly, I, I, get, I, I buy that there wasn't a little boat. Um, okay, so anyway, there's, so we have rejected soundly the vicariant hypothesis as well as this land bridge hypothesis. So the only thing we're left with is dispersal. So yes, it's difficult to explain. I, I acknowledge that, absolutely. But it's the only thing we're left with. When you reject hypotheses, you know, finally you're left with one and you have to start thinking, well, that's the best explanation that we have. So I, you know, have been buying the dispersal hypothesis for quite some long time. But those who are doubters have raised two points. They say, well, the surrounding ocean is too deep. Um, so you can see that the blue and purple colors are very, very deep. And that's, you know, so all of the ocean around Madagascar is quite deep. Um, and also, more damning yet, is that the currents, the ocean currents, flow in the wrong direction today. If we're, we're talking about the flow of ocean currents today, they move sort of from the north um, sort of south and west. So it would move things, it would tend to move things you would think more from Madagascar to Africa than the reverse. So this is what the prevailing wisdom is. Well, along come Ali and Huber um, and their paper in Nature. And I actually got to review this paper. And I, I mean, I've never been happier to review a paper in my life, uh, just about. And it 
was accepted and has gotten a lot of press. But one of, the, one of their observations is that um, they did paleo reconstructions using the configuration of the continents at the time, you know, so not what the continents looked like now, but what did they look like then and what were the sort of prevailing currents like and what was the world's climate like, you know, so they, they're taking, they're not projecting what's going on now into the past, they're looking into the past and saying what was, what were things like then, um, and what they found, and it took, apparently this simulation took three years on supercomputers, so it's not an easy matter, um, but the main point is that the, they, in their study, found that the flow would have been from Africa to Madagascar, and it would have allowed rapid transport directly to Madagascar from Africa, and at very high rates, um, exceeding 20 centimeters per second. Um, so again, flow was from west to east, and this was true from the early Eocene up to the mid-Miocene, which is the range of dates that we see for all of the um, mammals in Madagascar. Um, and Jason Ali found, me, <laughs> found out that I was one of the reviewers by it was a crazy explanation. I won't go into it. Um, but he and I started emailing back and forth, and he said, well, look, you know, let me tell you, this was actually a minimal maximum velocity value. If we throw in a correctly configured cyclone, we might be up at one meters per second for a few days of the transit. So it could have been a very fast transit indeed. And I could go on and on about the different mechanisms. But this is, again, uh, was a lot of fun to see this in the press. Okay, so to sum up this part of the talk, the current data, presence, absence data, molecular phylogenetic, and paleoclimatological give remarkably strong signal that present-day biota is predominantly made up of neoendemics that disperse from Africa uh, during the early Eocene to mid-Miocene, so this sort of like 30 million year window. Um, and as a conservation biologist, I mean, so I find that fascinating as an evolutionary biologist, but as a conservation biologist, it has deep meaning in that it tells the world, tells everyone, that lemurs and other Malagasy endemics are unique evolutionary experiments precious, irreplaceable. This will never happen again. They, they are the work of millions and millions and millions of years of evolutionary history acting on just these crazy accidents of uh, weather and what all. Okay, so um, another, so here they are, these precious, uh, irreplaceable things. And as I, I've hinted at, there's just incredible diversity in the organisms that are found in Madagascar. So it's even been called sort of a speciation laboratory. And what's, all that, what's that all about? Well, there are various ideas about it. Um, but one thing that is true is that if we track species discovery or newly described species over time, and it goes all the way back to 1758 up to 2004, it just keeps climbing and climbing. The more we look, the more we find. It's not because they, you know, new species are arising, but it's because we're just using scientific methods to go out and look and see what the diversity is, and, and it's just accelerating faster than we can count, really, um, especially for primates. Um, so here's, as I promised, uh, an illustration of how wildly different um, mouse lemurs look from one another. This was a, plate, a color plate in a paper describing uh, eight new mouse lemur species, and the point of this illustration is to show you how different mouse lemur species are from one another, and I think most of you would agree that it's hard to <laughs> tell that they're brown and they're little. Um, so this is what we call cryptic morphological variation, and one thing that we observe about mouse lemurs, unlike humans and gorillas, which we're diurnal, right? We're, vision is our main cue about recognizing each other. These are nocturnal animals. This is what the world looks like to them, not much. So they're getting their cues in other ways. So it's not terribly surprising that there wouldn't be a drive to look different if you're talking about mate preference in particular. Um, and there's a bat biologist uh, whose last name is Jones, and I love this quote of his, which is so obvious. It says, nocturnal species are more likely to be cryptic than our diurnal species when perception of differences are based on human vision. So, I mean, we go on and on about cryptic species, and that's so anthropocentric because they don't care whether we can tell or not. They care whether they can tell if they're different species. And indeed, um, there's a lot of it evidence that they have a lot of very fine-tuned uh, mechanisms for telling one another apart, particularly with mate recognition. So in the case of mouse lemurs, 
um, with the mail advertisement calls, if you look at, and this is before we had all this fancy taxonomy um, and species recognition for the mouse singer. So this is an eastern mouse singer, and that's a western mouse singer. That's really all we know. But if you listen to the, the male, you know, singing the love song to the girl, um, if we listen to the one from the east, it's going to sound sort of like chirp, chirp. And if we listen to the guy from the west, he's going to kind of go buzz. Um, so very different. Um, so they're, they're definitely signaling to each other differently. Um, now this is, I'm, I'm not even going to try to explain this figure to you, but it's basically mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA and looking at their congruence. This is work that's ongoing and actually is about to be published in PLOS One. Um, so, so far, we think we're seeing at least 16 species of these little mouse lemurs. Um, and there, we have hints that there are other populations out there that also might be um, individual species. So there's still a lot of field work that we need to do. But it's wild. There's a lot of diversity there. Um, now, one, one reason that this is so important, um, I just, this is sort of a back of the envelope thing. I started going back through um, the literature, just looking at numbers of publications when it was a two species taxonomy, then it went to a three species, to a four species, to an eight species, and now we're up to 16 or you know more. And you can see that the number of publications has increased each time we've recognized more uh, species diversity, and then in 19 or 2008, it was all the way up to 60. I didn't, I haven't done 2009 yet. So it's this really great cycle of, you know, uh, cause or consequence. I don't know, but the more we know, the more we recognize, and the more we recognize, the more we want to know, and you know, it just keeps going. So that's a great thing. Um, Okay, now I'm going to segue a little bit. So we're so that's one of the things that we're doing now in the lab um, with great uh, focus and ferocity is we're trying just to recognize what is the species diversity out there in Madagascar because, as I've told you, the place is being ravaged. And so we're losing species faster than we can actually even describe them. So it's a really rather urgent scientific um, enterprise just to actually describe and recognize the biodiversity that is there. Um, so we're using these sort of DNA sequencing and phylogenetic methods. We're also doing, we're segueing into something called ecological niche models, which use uh, geographic information system data. And what it does is it's, these are calculations that predict the fundamental niche or potential distribution of a species using various climatic and geographic variables like temperature, rainfall, elevation, et cetera. And what I'm going to show you is a figure that is derived from one of these um, analyses. And the hot colors indicate high ecological suitability, and cool colors indicate low suitability. So, oh, and these are just, I mean, so there's, and it's a very rich data set, you know, of rainfall and temperature and elevation, and it just goes on and on, seasonality. So it's, it's really quite a sophisticated um, method. Um, so this is what one of these ecological niche models looks like, and here are these different locality data for whatever organism this is. And again, like the red indicates, this is a highly suitable area, and here they wouldn't be able to survive. So that's the point. So it tells you something about ecological suitability for different organisms. So we have used this um, in a recent study of these uh, lizards, Oplurus, and there is the uh, hypothesis that we have two species, but it's based on very subtle morphological distinctions, and they're distributed along the western coast of Madagascar. So it's really debatable as to whether they're different species or not. So we're using the combination of genetic methods, um, you know, phylogenetic methods, and this ecological niche modeling to try to get at this. Okay, so <laughs> right now this doesn't look like much of anything, but the white spots are collecting uh, localities for one species, one putative species, and the brown, the black spots are collecting localities for another. And this, as you will soon see, is actually Western Madagascar. So what we're going to do, now we can see Madagascar, it's rotating around. You can see the white dots representing uh, one putative species, black dots representing the other. Here's the phylogeny. So you can see very clearly that the genetic data are showing that these are two different clades. So that's a strong indicator. Here's the niche model for this species. So it's showing this habitat is very suitable, this is completely unsuitable. And conversely, for this species, this is very suitable and that's completely unsuitable. And that blew my mind because just from like a sort of a naive field perspective, you would think it's the same thing because it's dry, 
you know, scrubby habitat, but something, they're, they're doing something very different. So we're able to sort of see this, you know, if you will call it ecological speciation going on. So these are two very strong pieces of evidence to say, yes, they're two different species. Okay, um, back to the conservation message. Um, these guys are all severely endangered. Um, and, you know, and it just gets worse. Add on top of that global warming. We've all heard about global warming, and I'm here to tell you it's true. It's really happening. Um, Paul Krugman had a great article called Global Weirding um, because there's been a lot of, you know, well, it was really cold in Washington this year, so therefore there's no thing, you know, such thing as global warming. Well, it's <laughs> the weather's just going to get weirder and weirder, you know, with a general rise in temperature globally, but just weirdness going on everywhere. So global weirding if you prefer. Um, but this is, you know, this is tracking uh, global temperatures from 1880 to 2000. And, you know, if you don't agree that there's a big spike there, um, you need glasses. Um, okay, so the predict so I just went and I wanted to look at the range of putative rises in global temperature. The most conservative or the, you know, least um, a severe would be 1.1 degrees Celsius up to 6.4 degrees, which is, you know, baking. Um, but this is all predicted to occur within the 21st century. And I wanted to take that um, and look at the effects on lemur distributions and their survival if we modeled in global warming on top of these ecological niche models, which are showing us what it looks like today. Um, so here is the Indri, which is the largest living lemur now. It's, um, this is the one that we were hearing the calls of earlier tonight at dinner. Um, and this is their current climatic conditions, and this is their ecological niche model. So all these red hot zones are the places that are most suitable for them. And indeed, they are eastern rainforest um, dwelling organisms. This is what their habitat looks like. So we would think of this as very... Um, sensitive to global warming and, you know, because it's cool and wet. So if things get really warm and dry, it's going to be bad news for the injury. Um, and sure enough, if we increase global temperatures by two degrees, you can see a, a major shrinking of their uh, suitable habitat. Four degrees, it's virtually gone. Six degrees, it is gone. You know, there are no more injury. So then I thought, well, let's look at a lemur that is adapted to hot, dry environments and conditions, and are they going to do better in the global warming scenario? So here's the ring-tailed lemur, and this is current climatic conditions, and sure enough, they're found um, primarily in the southwest and not in other parts of Madagascar. Um, this is what their habitat looks like. Global increase of just two degrees, and they lose actually the place where they're found, um, so it's very it's surprisingly even more severe for the ring-tailed lemur than for the injury with a low increase. Uh, four degrees, looking very bad. Six degrees, gone. Um, so this is all very sobering because it's a 100-year window, and evolution is not going to have time to catch up with that. You know, evolution doesn't operate on those scales. It's just we need to intervene, or I don't know what. We need to stop global warming. So what are we doing to try to help. Um, well, my lab, we're doing all this phylogenetic, genetic, you know, uh, modeling type of work. Uh, we have colleagues in the field, Malagasy colleagues in particular, who are out collecting samples, you know, really studying the organisms, finding out where they live, what they're doing, and we feed back to each other all the time. So they're sending us samples, we're finding things out, we're asking questions, well, how about this spot? They go to that spot, and you know, it's, it's just a blast, really, <laughs> you know, so it's very, I think it's important, but it's also a, a whole lot of fun. Um, and I, as part of that, I've become very involved with educating and working with Malagasy students and scholars, so I taught a course over there, as Jack mentioned, in 1997 at the University of Antananarivo, fantastic group of students, and I look at their faces and I see them, they're now like in NGOs and they're faculty at the university and they're, you know, uh, aspiring politicians, you know, so there's, there really is this class being built of, of really sophisticated uh, young Malagasy people who, you know, care and know what to do. Um, and sure enough, they're training their students in what to do. So, you know, I had always hoped and thought that that would be enough, um, that they would have this, you know, ability to, you know, shape their own future. But as I've told you, the political situation is in total chaos. Things are really messed up. The mining is just going on full tilt. And so they're working as hard as they can to fix things, but 
it's it's an uphill battle. So I don't know. Um, we'll see how it goes. So enter the Duke Lemur Center. We're very committed to conservation in Madagascar. Um, on site at, in the Duke Forest down in North Carolina, we have about 230 individuals uh, living there and a bunch, you know, hundreds more in zoos. Um, and we have at least 20 species, depending on your species concept. And we're all about conservation, education, and research. And if you were to come to Duke and see our lemur center, they, um, a lot of the animals free range in the forest uh, during the warm summer months, and so life is pretty good. Uh, we got lemur babies. Um, these are some ring-tailed lemurs um, with their babies. And it's a great place for students who want to, you know, have sort of a semi free-ranging environment in which to study lemurs and, you know, they're up in the trees and they're be behaving naturally and so on. So it's a great learning place. Um, but even more importantly, I believe, uh, the work we're doing in Madagascar, working with local Malagasy to teach uh, different agricultural techniques, sustainable agriculture, et cetera, um, has, been, has had, I think, a good impact. But what I'm most proud of is a project that was uh, started back in 1997 and went through 2001, where we took some black and white uh, rough lemurs that were born at the Duke Lemur Center, and we returned them and reintroduced them uh, to a wild population um, in a place called Betampun. And what, the reason I show you this is because of this release program, which has been successful. They've had babies and they've resuscitated the genetic, um, you know, viability of the lemurs that were extant there. But more importantly, if you Google Earth it, you can see this polygon of perfectly preserved uh, or near perfectly preserved lowland uh, rainforest habitat in Madagascar, and it's just devastation all around. And the reason that it persists is because of this activity and the, you know, patrolling of the area and the study of the animals and just the human concern for the animals. So these kinds of things are things that we're doing in Madagascar and we want to do more of. Um, so I'll end with a quote from Darwin. Um, who said, we see in many cases that rarity precedes extinction, and we know that this has been the progress of events with those animals which have been exterminated, either locally or wholly, through man's agency. To feel no surprise at the rarity of a species and yet to marvel greatly when the species ceases to exist is much the same as to feel no surprise at sickness, but when the sick man dies to wonder and to suspect that he died by some deed of violence. Um, so as so Darwin, um, beautifully written and uh, rather dramatic. But what he's basically saying is act now and prevent regret later. So... Uh, I, that's what we're trying to do, and I urge you all to go out and do good in the world. And I want to acknowledge all of my collaborators and fabulous lab folks without whom I couldn't have done any of this, um, and they did most of the work that I presented anyway, and all the funding agencies that have supported my research. And I thank you again very much for having me.